Um, greetings, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Hopefully, everyone is back uh, from the break. And welcome to the Molecular Biology and Systematic session. My name is Tembani Mkize, and I'll be chairing this session. In a symposium mostly dominated by people of ecology and biodiversity background or interest, it is very important to have this systematic session with the fishes being the most diverse group of living vertebrates, systematics has had a big duty of classifying and grouping these fishes. At first, they were grouped based on their external and internal morphology. Despite the success of grouping fishes based on their morphology, the development of molecular techniques have assisted in strengthening studies of fish systematics. They do so through confirming what is already known from morphological studies and revealing some cryptic species that cannot be separated using their morphology. So using both morphology and molecular techniques has proven to be very important for fish systematics as these techniques supplement for each other's disadvantages. So I'm looking forward to learning about different techniques used in different case studies in the five talks that will be presented in this session and their findings also. So without wasting any time, I would like us to quickly go to our first talk, which will be presented by Tadiwa Mukizo. Greetings to you all. My name is Tadiwa Mukizo, and I'm here to share with you some of the work that I've been doing for my PhD study. I've been looking at the molecular morphological investigation of the taxonomic diversity within three genera of freshwater fishes within Southern Africa. Southern Africa is a diverse array of freshwater fishes. Unfortunately, the diversity of many of the species within this region is not well documented. This complicates attempts at conservation and management of these species, as well as limits our ability to understand the phylogenetic relationships between these species and the processes that have shaped the diversification and speciation of species within Southern Africa. The aim of my study was to use molecular and morphological data to uncover hidden diversity and describe new species within three genera of freshwater fishes in Southern Africa, namely Atromomyris, Chyloglanus, and Brysinus. The first group that I worked on were the species from the genus Atromomyris. This genus is part of the family Momeridae. The Momeridae are well known for their ability to produce weak electric organ discharges. These are electric houses that they use for exploring their environment as well as communication. When I began working on the Atromomyris and Soji species complex, it was thought to be a, well, a widely distributed species, but its type locality was not known. It was also still in the genus Hippopotamus. The presence of diversity, hidden diversity within Hippopotamus and Soji has been known for a long time. However, some of the earliest work that showed the presence of this hidden diversity was work by Kramer et al. in 1996, who showed through the use of electric organ discharges as well as allozymes that there were at least two morphs of this species within the Upper Zambezi River. They followed up the study with the description of Hippopotamus saboy from the Upper Zambezi in 2004, and later in 2010, they described another species, Hippopotamus longilateralis, from the Kuneni River. More recent studies using genetic material by Chapona et al. were able to show that there were at least two lineages in the uppers in the eastern Zimbabwean highlands, as well as one in the Mulanshi freshwater ecoregion that were not currently described from this region. These earlier studies highlighted the presence of hidden diversity within small sections of the hippopotamus Sasochi distribution range. A more comprehensive study using specimens collected from across the entire range of hippopotamus and such was undertaken. And this study showed that there were at least 10 unique lineages within this species that were not documented. Each of these lineages were found to be restricted to single river systems. And of interest was the Kwanza River, which had at least five unique lineages within it. In addition to finding unique diversity within this species, the study also suggested the Kwanza River as the type locality for Bobotamus and Soji. As highlighted earlier, the generic placement of Hippopotamus and Soji was of contention since it was not monophyletic with the type species of the genus Hippopotamus castor. 
However, a breakthrough in resolving this uncertainty came through the work by Salif and et al., which was able to sequence a holotype of heteromomyosis radiators. And from their study, they were able to show that the Southern African hippopotamus species placed in hippopotamus were monophyletic with heteromomyris posteriorities. As such, the decision was made to move all Southern African hippopotamus species into the genus heteromomyris. With the resolution of the generic placement of heteromomyris on Soji, as well as the discovery of its type locality within the Kwanza River, this study aimed to follow up on these studies and describe six new species from the known lineages of heteromomyris and soji. Since previous studies had focused on the use of genetic data to identify new lineages within heteromomyris and soji, this study focused on the use of morphological data to identify distinguishing characters for each of these lineages. In this study, we identified six new species from heteromomyris and soji. These species were mainly distinguished by the meristic counts, such as the number of scales along the lateral line, number of scales along the caudal peduncle, number of scales around the caudal peduncle, the number of total vertebrae, as well as the head shape of some of the species. The next group that I looked at were the referred dwelling catfishes from the genus Chyloglanus. Historically, Chyloglanus pneumoniae was thought to be a widespread species within Southern Africa. This species was described in Tanzania from the Bubu River, and its distribution range was thought to spread from Tanzania all the way down to the Buzi River in Southern Africa. This is an unusual distribution pattern, and this is contrasted with the rest of the Southern African species that have relatively small ranges that are usually restricted to one or two river systems. This suggested that Caloglanus pneumoniae was a species complex. And this assertion was further supported by work by Chapona et al. 2018, who through the use of genetic data were able to show that there were at least six distinct lineages within the Eastern Zimbabwean Highlands and the Mulanja Freshwater ecoregion suggesting that Caloglanus pneumoniae is a species complex within Southern Africa. During service in 2016 and 2019, we collected specimens from the Kwazi River, which is part of the Manyame River system, a tributary of the Edo Zambezi River. The specimens we collected did not conform to any of the known species of Caloglanus within Southern Africa. And these specimens were not included in the Chacon et al. 2018 paper. As such, we thought that they represented a new species yet to be discovered. The aim of this study was to apply integrated taxonomic approaches in order to determine the taxonomic distinctiveness of the recently collected specimens from the Middle Zambezi system. The study used an integrative taxonomic approach, which included the use of the CO1 gene as well as morphological data. The genetic results identify the Mkwazi specimens as a unique monophyletic group, which was distinguished from all the Southern African species, as well as the lineages recorded by Chacon et al. 2018. The morphological data also showed that these specimens were unique, with three major diagnostic characters identified. The first was an extended dermal tissue covering the base of the dorsal fin. Second was an anterior adipose tissue phalange. And lastly, was the presence of 10 mandibular teeth, which were unique from species such as the Numenai, Fasciatus, or Bifacus, which had eight, on less than species such as Preterio, Paritas, and Spestera, which had 12 and 14, respectively. This study, in summary, this study shows that the Mkwazi specimens represent a new species. And there are currently eight species within Southern Africa, and possibly more species await description. The last group that we looked at were the species from the genus Brysanus. We looked at Brysanus lateralis, which is a species that was described from the Congo River. This species has a peculiar disjunct distribution, with populations isolated in KwaZulu Natal, the Lower Zambezi, and the Kafue River system. 
The aim of this study was to use molecular morphological approaches to investigate the diversity within Gristanus lateralis. This study used an integrated taxonomic approach, which included the use of the CO1 gene, morphological data, species delimitation methods, as well as clearing and painting. Preliminary genetic results show that the Bryssanus lateralis from Southern Africa is split into two lineages, one which is widely spread and the other which is limited to the Kwanzaa River system. Widely spread distribution can be uh, widely spread lineage can be found in the Kunene River, Okavango, Upper Zambezi, Congo, as well as the Mkuze River in KwaZulu Natal. Preliminary morphological results uh, show that the Kwanzaa River species are distinct from the rest of the Bryssanus lateralis uh, based on two major characters. Uh, the first being the insertion point of the dorsal fin of the Kwanzaa specimens is posterior to that of the other Bryssanus lineage. This is present in both males and females. In conclusion, this PhD shows that the freshwater diversity within Southern Africa is largely underestimated and there's still many species yet to be described. It also shows that many of the newly proposed species have relatively small distribution ranges, which may be a conservation concern. Lastly, it shows that there are complicated biogeographic processes that have shaped the species distribution and diversification within Southern Africa. And lastly, from our study, we show that there are at least six new species from the genus Heteromomeris, a single species from the genus Caloglanus, and one from the genus Brysinus. I would like to thank my supervisors, uh, the institutes that have provided funding and support for this project. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, thank you, Mutizwa, for that great presentation. Due to time, I will only take uh, one question and you can respond to the rest on the chat box. So there is one question from Gwyneth. Out of curiosity, which primer set did you use for the CO1 study? Hi, thank you very much for the question, uh, Gwen. Uh, so for the primer study, uh, for, I used two different sets, so I think the first one was the universal fish uh, primers. Then the other one was, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. In fact, I used the the fish the fish primers, the, the universal fish primers. Those are the ones that I use for the CO one data set. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, man. Sure. Uh, and you can respond to the rest on the chat box. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next talk is going to be presented by Toluana Ntokwan. Good morning. My name is Toluana and I'll be answering the question. Species identification <coughs> in the Southern African yellowfish levy barbers. Is DNA barcoding a useful tool? Labobarbus is an African genus which includes the large-sized and hexaploid Sopranidae species. In Southern Africa, there are 11 valid species of Labobarbus with at least one species present in all major river systems and in smaller coastal basins of Southern Africa. They are properly known as yellow fishes due to their golden or yellow coloration of the males during mating. Labor barbers are popular in angling communities and are a valuable resource. The popularity of the yellow fish has resulted in fish programs being established to unite communities and provide food for the local people. This genus is known to have species who possesses different mouth forms, which include a lab mouth form characterized by the presence of highly developed lips with a distinct fleshy lobe on the lower lip as seen in the top picture, and often large flaps on the upper lip, which is present in Lebebaus nejiga, the first species to be described in this genus. A vowel mouth form, which is characterized by a square-shaped lower jaw with thick musculature covering it, 
and a horny cutting edge, as seen in the picture below, which was first described in Vericunas basal. There are also several intermediate mouth forms as illustrated. The discovery of fishes with intermediate mouth forms and molecular analysis showing the non monophyletism of Vericunas, in which some species were more closely related to Libobarbus led to the synonymization of Vericunas with Libobarbus. This mouth variation is one of the phenotypic plasticity present in this species that has made species level identification challenging. To try and overcome these challenges, molecular approaches such as DNA barcoding have been explored. DNA barcoding is a method used for species identification through the use of molecular species tags based on short standardized gene regions. The barcoding method relies on differences on the genetic distance between individuals to assign a specimen to a particular species. The genetic distances between individuals from the same species is usually smaller than the distance between specimens from different species. And a genetic distance threshold known as the barcoding gap is established. This barcoding gap between conspecific and congeneric species is what is used for species delimitation. DNA barcoding has been successfully used in genetic studies to solve species complex and differentiating populations of cryptic species. For example, in Oreochromus, the authors found that the DNA barcoding approach was useful for assessing the variation of Oreochromus across their native range as most of the species could be discriminated. Success in using DNA barcoding has also been found in species where the morphological plasticity made species level identification challenging. The authors found 13 distinct lineages in the Cyprinid and Teromus moilepis. In both studies, cryptic species were discovered and as such, it was shown to be effective in aiding species discoveries in these studies. Therefore, the aim of the study was to determine the utility of DNA barcoding in identifying the morphologically recognized Southern African Libobaba species. Tissue samples from topotype specimens, which include Libobarbus quadrantoni, described from above the Victoria Falls in the Zambezi Basin, Libobarbus punguensis, described from the Puma Basin, Libobarbus maracuensis, described from the Mariko River in the Limpopo Basin, Libobarbus nesbreitensis, described from the Ngomati Basin, Libobarbus polylepis, described from the Glen River in the Ngomati Basin, Libobarbus natalensis, described from the Tugela Basin, Libobarbus sibari, from the Olifants Basin, Libobarbus kimbaliensis, described from the Orange Basin, and Libobarbus ineus, described from the Sakya River in the Orange Basin, which were deposited in the NRF Saib collection facilities, were used in the study. Topotypes are specimens that were collected from the same locality as the holotype of the species. The topotypes were selected due to evidence that there might be hidden species diversity in labor barbers specimens. Therefore, topotypes are likely to represent the true species. The standard DNA barcoding protocol, which includes DNA extraction from preserved tissues using salting out method, PCR amplification, and finally sequencing was followed. For data analysis, the Bayesian phylogenetic tree was drawn using Mr. Bayes, while the maximum likelihood tree was estimated using Rexamon. Three species delimitation methods were used. The assembled species by automatic partitioning, the automatic barcoding gap discovery, and the general mixed yield coercion method. This study generated CO1 sequences representing topotypes of nine of the 12 currently recognized species of Libobarbus from Southern Africa to explore the utility of DNA barcoding as a tool for uncovering species level differences between yellow fishes of this region. The maximum likelihood phylogenetic analysis showed that the Libobarbus sibari, natalensis, nasperitensis, Pongwensis, Mariquensis, Quadrantoni clades 
were well supported with the high bootstrap values between 90 and 100%. Results from three species delimitation methods all recover the nine independent lineages consistent with the nine species of labor bowers that are included in this analysis. From this study, it was shown that DNA barcoding was a useful tool for species delimitation in labor bowers. Therefore, we use the same method to assess the diversity of the widely distributed labor bowers mariquensis. Labor bowers mariquensis is currently the most widely distributed Southern African labor bower species, distributed from the middle and lower Zambezi to the Pongola system. It also has the highest number of synonyms, 19 sequences covering the entire distribution of the labor bowers mariquensis were generated. The results of the CO1 maximum likelihood analysis and Bayesian analysis show that labor bowers mariquensis could be separated into five lineages, the Nkomati Pongola lineage, the Mbuluza lineage, the Limpopo lineage, the Pungo lineage, and the Zambezi lineage. The recovered lineages were mostly found in different systems, except in the case of Nkomati and Pongola lineage. The Pungo clade was the only strongly supported clade with bootstraps over 90% and a posterior probability of one. The species delimitation methods inferred four to nine operational taxonomic units. These results show that DNA barcoding is useful for the identification of different labor power species in Southern Africa. One of the issues with species level identification of labor barbers is a lack of clear diagnostic characteristics and the occurrence of high variability in the morphology of these species, especially linked to the mouth types. Therefore, DNA barcoding can be another line of evidence for deciding on the taxonomic status of the Southern African labor barbers. One of the contributions to science by the present study is the formation of a reference library for the Southern African labor barber species. The barcoding of the topotype specimens with unambiguous morphological identification is a valuable practice to build reference libraries, especially for taxonomically poorly understood groups. Since there have been five lineages identified within labor barber's mariquensis, the morphological assessment is in progress to identify distinguishing morphological characteristics between these lineages. Thank you for listening to my talk. I would like to acknowledge the following institutes and people for helping me in this project. Thank you so much, Tolan, for that presentation. Uh, I only have time for one question. So if anyone has a question for Tolan, you can just raise your hand. doesn't seem like we have questions, but uh, just a question from someone with weak uh, genetic background. With these uh, different lineages, does it mean that we, we may be getting five different species? Okay, so the CO1 is an indication, but we have to do morphological study to confirm. So we normally, rely on morphology to tell if there's a difference, definitely, and then we can describe new species. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Tolana. Uh, without wasting any time, let's move right to our next talk, which will be presented by Jordi Oliver. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordi Oliver. PhD candidate, and my project is looking at using cutting edge molecular tools to detect and monitor Gahardidae marine fishes. South Africa is known for its rich marine biodiversity. However, our marine ecosystems are under immense stress due to various threats, and rapid biomonitoring methods are needed for their effective management. The golden standard to survey our ecosystems are stereographs, bottom trawling, ROV, scuba diving, etc. Though these conventional biomonitoring methods are effective, 
They tend to be invasive, especially bottom trawling nets, rely heavily on taxonomic knowledge, can be time consuming, and tends to miss rare or elusive taxa. The last NDA, we have highlighted the need for novel biomonitoring methods of threatened marine taxa. Case in point is the critically endangered African coelacan. As many of you know, this species occurs in inaccessible submarine caves in moderately deep water in the West Indian Ocean. In addition to their protection status, studying their distribution range and population trends can be quite challenging. Severely overexploited taxa such as sea bream, specifically the family Stadidae, were also highlighted in the last NDA. For example, the 74 sea bream, which is considered critically endangered, is a South African endemic where its stocks actually collapsed in the 1960s and resulted in a moratorium being placed on the capture of the species. And novel methods are actually needed to support the reassessment of its conservation status. But now, how are we possibly going to monitor or detect species such as the African coelacan accurately and non-invasively? So this brings me to a relatively new method for the marine realm, a method that employs massively parallel sequencing using environmental DNA. This method relies on the isolation of DNA that was shed into the environment in either the soil, sediment, water, etc. So there's two methods. One, you can have a targeted species approach where you use species-specific primers, or you can have a metabarcoding approach, which is for your multi-species detection using your universal primers. However, this method is dependent on a reference barcode library. And in the case of water samples, it requires the filtration of large volumes. To overcome the limitations of the standard eDNA approach of using water samples, my co-supervisor, Professor Stefano Mariani, from Liverpool John Mills University and colleagues, recently discovered the use of sponges to survey marine ecosystems. As sponges act as natural eDNA samplers due to their efficient water filtering capabilities, as you can see in this video show, where they've used a non-toxic dye to determine the rate at which sponges filter water. And as you can see, sponges are filtering water within a few seconds. Which brings me to the aim of my study, which is to employ cutting edge molecular approaches to investigate the hardy South African fish diversity at both the community and population level, with the following objectives. To map coelacanth and sea bream distributions along eastern South Africa by metabarcoding eDNA originating from water and sponge samples. Secondly, to assess population connectivity and demographic trends of 74 and tall soldier through population genomic analyses. And thirdly, to incorporate this genomic data into spatial planning and management of priority taxa. However, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be focusing on objective one, looking at the sea. So for the eDNA component, the sampling area occurs across four MPAs, which is Pratia Banks, Aloha Shoal, Putakela, and Isimangaliso. And to date, 54 water samples and 56 sponge samples were collected across Pratia Banks, Utakela and Isimangaliso. In this deep connections first expedition that occurred in April this year, Ryan Palmer pioneered a targeted eDNA water collection method where he attached two 1.75 litre Mescan bottles to the ROV. As shown in this video, he uses the pull of the arm to keep the Mescan bottles open, and once the ROV reaches the desired site, he releases the claw to close the Miskin bottles. The type of water sample design, water was collected from known and potential silicon sites, where three biological replicates were collected for the surface water, deep water by CTDRZ, and by ROV. Water was then filtered through a sterevix filter using a 
vacuum pump. Standard protocols for contamination prevention was followed. In addition, sponges were also collected using the ROB arm with three biological replicates collected per site and once aboard the vessel, subsamples were taken and preserved in 99% ethanol. Once the samples reached the lab, DNA was extracted using the eZNA kit for water, a modified protocol by Sally et al. 2018 for the sponges. DNA was then amplified for the targeted approach we used, the quantitative PCR using the developed silicon primers. For fish metabarcoding, we used the 16X primer. DNA was then sequenced on the aluminum mice platform here at SIAD. Then for quality checking and filtering of sequences, we used mother. Then for data analysis, we plan to use the vegan package um, in R to determine the differences in the biodiversity between sampling regions and then also do a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling in mass. For the targeted eDNA approach to detect silicon DNA, a species-specific primer set was designed by Dr. Peter Shump from Professor Mariani's lab. This primer is roughly 200 base pairs in length. I then did an in-situ testing of the primer. To determine the lower limits of the primer, I did a dilution series of silicon DNA, as shown in wells 4 to 8. Though faint, well 8 shows that the primer is able to detect low concentrations of silicon DNA. I then did a cross species amplification testing of the major fish groups. As shown in wells 10 to 16, we can see that none of the major fish groups were amplified. I then tested the primer using environmental water samples collected from sites in the Isimang Lisa MPA. So this is just a gel image showing the qPCR run that was done. Wells 3 to 7 just shows the dilution series of the silicon DNA. Well 10 and then 12 to 19 is the water samples. As you can see in well 19, the primer successfully detected silicon DNA from water collected by ROB in a cave in Jessica Canyon that was 2 meters away from 4 silicons. This sample was then sequenced and blasted on the NCBI database and confirmed that it was indeed silicon DNA as it gave 100% identification and the sequences aligned perfectly. However, it must be noted that some of the environmental samples are giving non-specific PCR bands and is currently under investigation. So what's next? Going forward, once the sponge protocol has been optimized, we want to determine where the sponges are better depositories of silicon DNA than water samples. We then want to determine whether the silicon caught of East London in 1938 was a strain or if there's a population we are unaware of. We then want to determine whether this method can be useful in enormous canyons such as Trulu Canyon that is 43 kilometers wide, which is basically the distance from Mankanda to Bathurst. We then also want to determine whether this marker is variable enough to detect intraspecific diversity. I would like to thank the following organizations and people for without them, this work would not be possible. Um, thank you so much, Jody, for that in interesting presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if Jody is still around to answer questions, but let me wait and see. I just got information that Jody has some load shedding problems. So I think it's better that we just move to, to the next speaker. So in that case, our next speaker is going to be Martinez. And I'm sure Jody is going to respond to your questions in the chat box once she connects again.
So let's move to Martinez. Morning, everyone. I'm Martinez, and I'll be talking about a new species of enteromius, a small minnow that we're describing from the Steelput River in South Africa. Enteromius is a genus of small bodied diploid minnows endemic to Africa. They have scales with the radial striae and seven to eight dorsal fin rays. The type species for Enteromius is Enteromius potomogalis from the Gabon, Equatorial Guinea area. Enteromius is not monophyletic, nested within the genus of the genera Barboetus, Cicobarbus, Theobarbus, and Prolabials. And therefore, much more taxonomic work is needed. There's about 350 valid species with more continuously being described or invalidated. There's about 41 species in Southern Africa, of which 23 are endemic to South Africa. African minnows are informally grouped based on the morphology of the primary dorsal fin ray. So the saw fins have a spinous and serrated primary dorsal fin ray. All the spine fins have a spinous but not serrated dorsal fin ray, and the soft braid minnows have a normal flexible soft braid. Within the soft braid minnows, two further groups can be identified. And these are the chubby heads, which are endemic to the cooler areas of South Africa, and then the goldies, which have small compact bodies, two pairs of barbels. 24 to 30 lateral line scales and a bright golden male breeding coloration. Three species are currently placed within the Goldies, and they are Enteromius brevipinus from the Incomati River system, Enteromius pallidus from the Barkans River, and then Enteromius neophy, the side spot minnow, from the upper Zambezi, and which will be the subject for the rest of the talk. Enteromius neophy was first described by Greenwood from specimens collected from the Kabombo River. Enteromius neophy can be distinguished from the other goldies by the presence of the thin, wavy, parallel lines running along the body. Furthermore, there is a varial number of dark spots on the midline, and there are dark spots at the base of the Caudal fin and the pectoral fin. When it was first described in Dromius nephi, it was thought to be confined to the upper Zambezi and the uh, southern Congo system. In the late 1960s, another population was discovered <clears throat> in the Olifant River system and assigned to Dromius nephi based on morphological characteristics. So this then led to this divided distribution we see today. For freshwater fish with limited dispersal abilities, this raises a few questions on whether they are the same species. And from early on, there were indications that some color coloration pattern differences existed, but it hasn't been formally investigated until now. So our methods included an integrative economic approach, which means that we used distribution data, molecular methods. So we generated co one barcodes for both populations. Uh, we used four species delimitation methods. Two are genetic distance-based and two are fee-based. We measured 22 morphological characters and 14 meristic characters. We generated a phylogenetic tree based on scale one sequences for intramia species that we generated or that were generated by SIAB and available on GenBank or on BOLD. So while the classification of the minnows into Orphan, spine fin, and soft red minnows 
doesn't appear to be uh, monophyletic. The heavy and the goldies do come out of monophyletic clades. And then we zoomed in on the goldies. This is the results of the goldie clade on its own. All four of the species delimitation methods showed the existence of eight operational taxonomic units, which corresponds to the eight separate species. We can clearly see that the Enteromius nephi from the Zambezi is separate from the Enteromius nephi from the Limpopa. And in fact, they are not that closely related. The sister group to the Enteromius nephi from Zambezi is Enteromius pallidus from the Parkins, and the sister group to the southern new species is Enteromius viviparis from Mclaughlin. With the molecular results clearly indicating that we are dealing with two separate species, the next step was to find any morphological characteristics that would be taxonomically informative to separate the two species from each other. So we measured and counted characters from 16 specimens from the Zambezi and 20 specimens from the southern Neophyte. And the meristic results after running principal component analyses showed that there was some separation between the two species. Um, and this separation was based mainly on the number of lateral line scales. But there was some overlap, which means that it's not taxonomically informative. Results from the morphometric measurements showed even more overlap, saying that none of these characters would be taxonomically informative to separate between the two species. We then had a look at the coloration patterns. And with the coloration, there were a couple of consistent differences between the two species. The northern near feet has the wavy parallel lines extending below the lateral line and onto the belly. Whereas in the southern near feet, these lines do not extend below the lateral line onto the belly. Furthermore, the northern nephi has dark rounded spots on the dorsal midline, whereas in the southern nephi, these spots do not occur. So based on the molecular results and the co consistent color pattern differences, a new species is being described from the steel grotto. The new southern species is also part of the Baldy group with a compact body, two pairs of barbels, 27 to 30 lateral line scales, and a gold coloration of breeding males. They're also extending the definition of the Baldy group to include Enteromius pinwoodi, Enteromius malacensis, and Enteromius viviparis. The taxonomic, taxonomic identity of Enteromius brevitinus needs to be resolved. There are some conservation implications with describing the new species from the Limpopo. As it stands, Enteromius nephi is currently listed as least concern, but the southern population was uh, assessed a few years ago and listed it as near threatened. Issues are water abstraction, pollution associated with farming and timber production in the area, and alien fish, especially trout and largemouth bass, is a problem. Therefore, conservation management of the upper catchments are important. Thanks to Albert and Pedro for the supervision and Andre Hoffman for collecting the from the Gilbert River.
and the NRF fab and NRF FIP for providing the funding for the study. Thanks for listening, everyone. Cheers. Um, thank you so much, Martinez. That was a very interesting um, presentation. Um, if anyone has questions for Martinez, you can raise your hand or write in the chat box. Um, I don't see any questions for Martinez. Uh, I'm just gonna ask one. I'm just wondering with the new species being described, I guess um, a new conservation plan is needed. So I'm just wondering if the plan will be identical to that of the already known species or it would be something completely different, which especially since uh, the species are so close and closely related. Um, no, I'm not sure. I think that's for the conservation yeah. plan is to, to, to sort out. I think we just provide the information for them um, about what okay. is happening and uh, now. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Hopefully we have conservation guys here who can tell us what happens after that stage. Yeah. Um, is there anyone with a question for Martinez before I let him go? Okay, it doesn't look like we have other questions. Uh, thank you so much, man. That was a very great talk. Yep. Thanks for letting. Cheers. Okay. Uh, if there is anyone who still has a question, you can always use the chat box to interact with the presenter. So that brings us to the last speaker of our session, which is Yonela Sitole. Hey everyone, I will be presenting on molecular and morphological evidence of hidden species diversity in the Zambezi Granda in southern and south central Africa. The catfish family Okinoglanidae Bay is endemic to the African continent. It was previously considered a subfamily of Carotidae and has been recently elevated to the family level. It comprises 22 species divided over three genera. Within this family, Parachinoclanis is the most diverse genus containing 11 species. These species are distributed over five of the 10 interfonal provinces. In the previous chapters explored the diversity of Parachinoclanis species occurring in the Congo Basin using morphology and or genetics. The results from these chapters reveal that the Congo Basin harbors the highest single basin species diversity for the genus and the widely distributed species are possible species complexes containing still undescribed species. Among these is Parachinoglanes namensis, known in Southern Africa and also South Central Africa. Parachinoglanes namensis has long been known as a widely distributed species in four river systems, Okavango, where it was first described, Upper Zambezi, Kasai River in the Congo Basin and recently in the Kwanza River. Specimens of the Parachinoclanis namensis group are identified by a broad humeral process, five to seven vertical rows of spots and rough or poor skin. There have been uncertainties about the taxonomic status of Parachinoclanis namensis. For example, in Gearing's revision of the genus, the Okavango Zambezi specimens were reported to have numerous small black spots on the background, while these spots are lacking on the Kasai specimens. Arrested 2008 further investigated this color pattern variation, and he confirmed the results from the previous study. And apart from the color pattern differences, he also reported differences in the caudal finish shape. In this study, specimens from Lake Kalundo in the Upper Zambezi were identified as hybrid between these two populations. In the recent study conducted in the Congo Basin, the Kasai specimens were further differentiated into Luenda and Chuembe, resulting in four potential species within Parachinoclanes namensis, 
based on color pattern and combination of morphological characters. However, these uncertainties have not been resolved yet, and Parakina glanisnamensis is still identified as a single widely distributed species. And therefore, the aim of this study was to explore the possible existence of hidden species diversity within Parakinoglanes namensis using a combination of molecular color pattern and morphological data. The objectives were to identify unique lineages within these species and to determine their morphological differences. 38 sequences were generated at SIEP covering the distribution range of parakinoglanus namensis. Additional sequences for other parakinoglanus species were obtained from GenBank. Four species delimitation methods were used to identify potential candidate species or unique lineages within parakinoglanus namensis. Several genetic softwares were used for analysis. For morphological analysis, 124 specimens identified as Parakinoglanus namensis were sourced and examined at SIEP and Royal Museum for Central Africa Fish Collections. For each specimen, observations, seven counts, and 45 measurements were taken. Color pattern was characterized as follows presence or absence of spots on head and fins, and also between vertical rows the shape and the number of vertical rows of spots. The phylogenetic results revealed that Parakinoclanus namensis complex is not a monophyletic group, as three major clades here identified with yellow circles were recovered. These will be discussed shortly. Additionally, all four species delimitation methods revealed seven candidate species or unique lineages within Parakinoclanus namensis, these corresponding to Okavango Zambezi, two for Kwanza, and four for Kasai. The sequence divergence between these lineages ranged from 2.1 and 7.9%. Firstly, we zoomed into clade one. This clade contains three lineages identified by different colors, green for Okavango and Zambezi, red and pink for Kwanza one and Kwanza two lineages respectively. These lineages are characterized by round caudal fins and unspotted bubbles. Color pattern changes between small and large specimens were noted. Therefore, all the comparisons presented here are based on specimens of the similar size class. The Okavango Zambezi lineage is differentiated by heavily spotted head and fins, and also the presence of spots between vertical rows. While Kwanza 1 is differentiated by a slightly concave dorsal fin profile and the absence of spots between vertical rows, and the Kwanza 2 lineage is differentiated by a long snout and shadow body depth. 2 and clade 3 contain samples from the Kasai River, all here named Kasai 1 to Kasai 4, and are differentiated from clade 1 by truncated caudal fin and no color pattern changes were observed between small and large specimens. These two clades differ from each other by a shape of the snout profile and also color pattern. Within clade two, the first lineage, which is Kasai one, is differentiated by a concave dorsal fin profile and the presence of one or two spots between vertical rows. While Kasai two lineage is differentiated by spotted bubbles, and the presence of numerous small spots between vertical rows. In clade three, Kasai three lineage is differentiated by big eyes situated more dorsally and body with vertical rows of blotches with a vermiculated pattern present between these vertical rows. While Kasai three or Kasai four rather is differentiated by a dorsolaterally situated eyes and also vertical rows of blotches but those on the lateral line are even bigger than the eye. Additional two morphological distinct populations without molecular data were identified in the Kasai. Although they share some morphological characters with clade two, these were differentiated from all other populations by long external mandibular bubble reaching the tip of the pectoral fin spine. They are also differentiated from each other by the absence or presence of spot on head and fins, and also several morphometric characters such as the adipose fin height. 
Paracinoglanesnamensis has long been known to be a widely distributed species in four river basins or sub-basins, Okavango, Zambezi, Gwanza, and Kasai. The genetic and or morphological results presented in this study show that it is a species complex containing nine species, three in Southern Africa and six in South Central Africa. Based on these results, Paracinoclanesnamensis is distributed in the Okavango and its adjacent river system, Zambezi. These systems were connected in the past and currently they still connect during high rainfall periods, hence they share similar fauna. Furthermore, Lake Kalundu, which was identified as a separate population in, the, in previous studies, could not be differentiated from Zambezi and Okavango specimens based on morphology and genetics. The previous studies might have overlooked the size-related color pattern changes within parochinoclanic species. The two newly described species from the Gwanza River are sympatric and syntopic. However, these two species, they do not seem to compete for same resources as morphologically they are quite different. Six new species are described from the Kasai River in the Congo Basin. The Kasai was once part of the Zambezi before it was captured by the Congo River. It is characterized by rapid waterfalls and parallel isolated affluents. These might have influenced the high species diversity observed in this river system. However, further investigation is still needed on this as the Kasai River is still poorly explored and poorly studied. The results from this study support the growing evidence that there is a hidden species diversity in widely distributed species. This was also evident in previous studies conducted on widely distributed freshwater fish species, such as Amphilias natalensis in southern Africa and Macosenius mori in the Congo Basin. These results also indicated that the species diversity in parochinoglanis is still underestimated. For example, at the beginning of this PhD, there were only nine species known within parochinoglanes, and this number has increased to 19 from just a revision of two species. All the newly described species have restricted distribution ranges in river systems that are threatened by anthropogenic activities such as mining and overfishing. Therefore, more sampling effort of these river systems and fish-related conservation measures are recommended. Thanks to everyone that contributed to the success of this study. Um, thank you so much, Yonela, for that talk. Uh, great work. Let's check if we have any questions for you in the chat box. Um, there is one question from Francesca. Thank you, Yonela, for this interesting work. A curiosity question, are you aware of any learning machine approach that may help resolving the taxonomy of fish or other taxa when you consider the morphological characteristics? Uh, thanks, Francesca, for your question. Uh, at the moment for fish, none that I know of, but uh, we, um, for, for, for morphology, we rely on different sources such as osteology, and also color pattern, meristics and morphometrics. But I know for, for flies, they recently um, launched something called SVE morph to, 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 to help with identification, but not that I know of uh, for any or for fish. Okay. Thank you, Onela. Um, great work again. Okay, there is another question from Anthony. Great talk. Thanks, Yonela. Great talk. Are there any current efforts to improve the management of these species and or are you feeding your data into the relevant management agencies? Uh, thanks, Anne, for the, for the question. Um, I have no idea of any uh, management uh, uh, efforts that are being uh, conducted for these species because uh, uh, they all uh, describe from uh, river systems that are still poorly explored. So that means that those river systems, they have no management uh, 
uh, uh, management, uh, what do you call it? Uh, conservation plans that are in place at the moment. So uh, like Tina's mentioned that we only are feeding yeah, relevant information to the management agencies. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Yonela. There is no other question for you. <laughs> uh, with that being said, we just came to the end of student uh, presentations in this session. Thank you so much, guys, for attending this session. Uh, now we'll hand over to Dr. Pagama in order to introduce our guest speaker. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm here to introduce us uh, with a lecturer at Stanford University. Current research focuses on the biodiversity, geology, and taxonomy of Southern African mangrove and estuarine ecosystems. Dr. Pia and her collaborators use a number of different techniques, including biodiversity surveys stable isotope analysis, environmental DNA sample collection, and underwater videos. Uh, as Nazarin is very passionate about including local communities in her research, she says uh, we are able to use our scientific tools and knowledge not to just for our, uh, not just for our own curiosity, but also to answer questions that come Sorry, everyone. Um, Pakama did mention that she's having some connectivity issues today. So I think I will just take over at this point. Um, yeah, so as Pakama mentioned, Nazreen is a lecturer at Stellenbosch University and she's working on South African mangrove ecosystems. I'm not sure if everybody caught that part, but just to add um, my side of the introduction, Nazreen is a passionate science communicator. So in addition to her research, she does a lot of science communication and she has a keen interest in science engagement. And she works quite a lot with local communities. Uh, she engages with um, people in the local communities and she uses their uh, traditional knowledge to develop conservation strategies that integrates their needs. And I think that is just really exciting um, to see. Uh, and she, I've always admired Nazreen um, and the passion that she has for her work and people as well. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about her journey. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of amazing lessons in her talk for our students and early career researchers. So thank you so much, Nazreen, for joining us. And I will now hand over to you. Thanks, Carla. Um, can you hear me firstly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, let me know if there's noise in my background because I am in a mildly busy place. But thanks for the, the really nice introduction as well as, um, yeah, giving me credit for things I haven't yet done. Um, but uh, very nice to, um, yeah, yeah, very nicely captured. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. You can just let me know uh, if you can see that. Um, <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm going to chat a bit about, uh, you know, at first I was going to make this a talk about my lessons as an early career researcher, but I thought that I couldn't quite leave out the ecology and a bit of uh, the work that we've been doing. So there we go. There we go. So um, our work is largely focused around mangrove ecosystems, and I won't really get into what mangroves are. You would have heard, you guys might all be familiar with what they are already. What I will say is that they have a cosmopolitan distribution, so largely um, distributed around the globe with the highest diversity in Asia. And um, you can see that on the East African coast, the mangroves extend all the way down into South Africa, where they reach a poleward um, distribution limit. And our work sort of focuses on these mangroves in southern Mozambique and in South Africa. 
And that's what I'll start talking a bit about today. Now, although it's, um, you know, the mangrove systems are relatively continuous, there are some key differences between South African and Mozambican mangroves. So firstly, our mangroves occur in a subtropical and temperate system, whereas Mozambican mangroves are a lot more tropical and subtropical. They also cover a much larger area in Mozambique compared to South Africa. There are a few more species. And then uh, the one thing that we'll come, keep coming back to is the management of protection, where in South Africa, our mangroves that are protected are mostly in national parks. So there's sort of top-down protection and uh, in Mozambique, it's very localized sort of management. There's not a lot of mangroves in national parks. So in South Africa, which is where our research started, you know, our mangroves have been extensively stu um, studied. And you guys would have heard from um, Prof. Adams earlier today. She she has you know really great knowledge of the mangroves, and um, she and her students and her colleagues have over the years really. Um, examined how mangroves have changed in South Africa. And this includes land use change as well as the southern expansion of mangroves. So a few years back, probably almost 10 years ago, we started noticing similar trends in the mangrove associated macrofauna. So uh, Jackie Rowe actually led the study and uh, documented the decline of the giant mangrove whelk. And then we did a nationwide survey, survey um, just to understand how these macrofauna distributions have shifted. And we noticed that while some species have disappeared from most sites, um, other species do display this poleward shift, right? And you might be familiar with the concept of the poleward shift, um, you know, under climate change, as um, global change effects come into effect, we are seeing a spread in distribution of not just biodiversity, but also um, weather events as they move towards the poles. So in South Africa, that means a Southern shift along our coastline. Now, what happens here is you either have a sort of a range expansion or a range shift and species would move into an area where they don't usually occur. This can be quite disruptive, firstly, because it could alter the behavior and the cycle of the species itself, or it could disrupt um, organisms in the new ecosystem where it might or might not be invasive. A lot of questions that we don't actually have the answers to. So these were just some of the species that we've noticed have moved down. Um, of course, it's not just a climate induced or global change induced poleward shift. There are many other drivers of um, species distribution. And so we've been studying some of these drivers over the years, specifically for fiddler crabs where we found that um, specifically biotic drivers uh, play an important role in influencing presence or abundance. Um, but then your abiotic drivers, such as your organic matter, grain size and shading, influence the abundance of these organisms. And of course, this is quite species specific. Um, and we had some great collaborators on the study and this is work that is sort of ongoing, trying to disentangle the factors that you know make fiddler crabs do what they do. So we learned a lot of lessons and there's a lot of future work going on in a South African context. And the first was this idea of the polewood spread. But then we see that there are several other factors that actually drive species distribution and almost limit the shift. And uh, we're noticing this for macrofauna. Um, Prof. Adams's group is noticing this or working on this for the mangrove trees themselves. Um, and of course, a lot of questions come up, sort of like what, which species are essential to sustaining ecological function and these services that mangroves provide? How does the spread, this forward spread, um, affect coastal ecosystems? And um, what about other global change effects? Um, you know, plastic pollution, changes in temperature and ocean acidification are all um, impacts that are being studied in the marine environment, uh, but not yet. We haven't really delved into them in a mangrove context, or we are only starting to. So there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of cool people working on this. Anyway, um, we then sort of moved over to Inyambane after a while and for about a year. Um, Inyambane, if you don't know, is a city in southern Mozambique located within the Inyambane Bay. 
So it's there are two small towns which you can kind of see on this map, it's Mashish and Inyambane. But the bay is mostly surrounded by local communities, which um, consists largely of fishers and harvesters. So, you know, collecting fish, crustaceans, mollusks, and even mangrove wood is a large part of daily life for a lot of these community members. And some other activities include things like tourism, pastoralism, subsistence farming. Um, and the bay is really quite cool because it's aligned sort of with mangroves and sea grasses. Um, Manuela Amone Mabuto, who is one of um, Prof. Adams' um, students, uh, studies the seagrass systems quite extensively, and they've just published a really interesting paper this year documenting the local use and perceptions around these seagrass habitats. So, of course, um, the communities themselves, and this was an extremely new thing for me um, to learn about this and to start speaking to communities at potential field sites, but communities themselves identified nursery habitats for the protection of reef and estuarine fish. And some of these are in association with nearby mangroves, some with the sea grasses. And I think there are nine on this map. They've since added two more. Um, so they have these no-take zones where fishing isn't allowed, harvesting isn't allowed for parts of the year or for the entire year. They've also undertaken like, um, intensive mangrove replanting initiatives, and they have the support of um, local government as well. Um, so the question then arises, uh, we, when we started moving into these sites and um, you know, showing an interest and talking to people in the area, we learned about these initiatives. And the question then started coming across, how effective actually are our efforts at um, you know, sort of creating these um, uh, refuge habitats and these are actually questions that we can answer like we have scientific tools to answer these questions so we we sort of designed this project and for the first time we had a very multi-stakeholder field team which is a again a learning was a huge learning experience so aside from just the ecologists we had the re relevant government employees we had a local ngo who was um, extremely instrumental in uh, establishing this link with the local community fishing council. And then of course the community members themselves wanted to join. Um, it's, it, I feel like Inyambani might be a unique situation in that the community councils are very invested in science as well. And aside from this, for the first time, we actually had community led questions. So we came up with these three aims. And um, the first, as you can see, is quite ecological. And that was to describe the mangrove habitat and ecology of the Inyambane Bay. Um, then to assess the efficiency of, of oh, sorry, um, to assess the efficiency of the no-take zones, which was our community-led question. And lastly, which was a much more sort of abstract aim, but something we realized that we needed to discuss and talk around was, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, to explore this relationship between scientists and communities. And of course, the idea was to try and use both our scientific methods, but also to document local knowledge as we went along. <clears throat> so our aim one, which was quite ecological. So um, the first thing we did, we sort of wanted to describe this mangrove habitat. You know, parts of these mangroves have been described. Um, the, the bunch of scientists from UCT, Day and McNay, and those guys that all did those epic, you know, cross country, seven year long surveys. They'd surveyed the northernmost mangroves at Murumbene, and they've, they'd come up with this really impressive list of species, but the rest of the mangroves were fairly understudied. So the first thing we wanted to do, because it's such a dynamic bay, is sort of classify our sample sites in terms of human use. So we had a scoring system where we looked at um, factors like harvesting, um, local protection and housing, as well as ferry traffic. And then we classified these into three different sorts of sites. Your urban sites being around your towns, your pristine sites being the northern and southernmost sites. And then sites that were heavily used but less impacted than urban sites sort of fell in between. We also found that there were characteristic species for these different zones. 
Um, so for example, some fiddler crabs are very characteristic of the pristine zones, whereas your urban zones um, are heavily populated by the um, soldier crabs, Statilla fenestrata, and your giant mangrove whelk, Terebralia palustris. And this is um, this pattern of like urban pristine heavily used is was sort of mirrored by the diversity of the actual mangrove trees themselves. Um, so using an importance value, we um, we could see that the urban sites were dominated by predominantly two species. So Sonoratia alba and Avicennia marina. Whereas as you moved away from these sites, you had more well mixed um, uh, stands and you can see from the pictures on the right that these stands or these trees are actually really big. Um, some people, you know, mentioned that there were uh, this tree that we were all standing in was 200 years old and, you know, it was part of stories that were told, um, um, you know, we haven't really explored that further, but generally these were some of the biggest mangroves I'd ever seen. Then for the fourth component of um, the description, we had a, um, a social component. So we, we wanted to understand community insight and perceptions. And we've got a, a PhD student, Juliana, who is currently working on this. Um, so we had our field notes, community-based workshops and semi-structured interviews to understand things like, um, or to understand community perceptions around changes in mangrove cover, um, the importance of mangroves, as well as the management systems around mangroves. So no results to report here yet. Juliana is still busy with um, her study. So for our second aim, which was to understand how efficient are these no-take zones, the most obvious choice, because our sampling needed to be non-invasive and non-extractive. So our most obvious choice was a BRAV trial. You can see our very homemade sort of BRAV setup with the uh, sardines in the canister. And um, Dr. Nicola James was also quite helpful. So thanks to you, Dr. James, for some um, advice on bruvs and how to construct them. And um, so this was just a trial run. And um, actually it was not such a great idea to use bruvs in Inyambane Bay because the water is fairly murky. And this was sort of the clearest water we had, as you can see on the right. So it was a bit of a, an error. But anyway, um, we also used an eDNA sample design. So this is um, eDNA, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is just um, you know large throughput sequencing of DNA from environmental samples. So in this case, we filtered a bunch of water. Um, so my master student, Jamila Janna, who is actually submitting her thesis today, good luck to her. Um, she came up with a study design to sample in fishing zones and in no-take zones. And um, we targeted three sort of um, areas. And um, what she found actually was that there was no real significant difference between the fishing zones and the no-take zones. And there could be a number of reasons for this. Firstly, um, these no-take zones, although they are historical, they were um, recently re-established um, to so they were recently re-established and it may not be a long enough time to see results but also Inyambane Bay is quite a, a well-mixed bay so and you know eDNA travels actually so um, we did learn a few other important lessons for example um, again we had very multi-stakeholder field trips there so there is a huge interest in using metabarcoding as a monitoring tool um, by the community. And we're actually not the only research group that they're working with to, to explore this um, using eDNA as a monitoring tool. And the, one of the reasons that they really liked it is with minimal training, they found it easy to collect the samples and it keeps us really good link with um, the scientific organizations that they've started working with. Also, it's quite attractive to funders. So um, it's, it's, yeah, it's been quite a success so far. Um, of course, they, it's up to them how much they want to monitor or, you know, whether they need additional help from us. But um, like I say, we're not the only group they're working with. The main challenge here is the logistical challenge. In Yambane Bay is like a six-hour drive from Maputo itself. Um, 
So getting samples back and getting equipment there is a bit of a mission. Okay, and then we also had a bit of a social component to this um, efficiency of no take zone question where uh, Juliana as part of her um, PhD and her using her semi-structured interviews and her focus groups looked at the roles of community fishers, uh, perceptions of changes in catch over time, as well as perceptions around management. Juliana's PhD is a lot about um, the impacts of climate change and how do we build resilience together with communities. So, um, you know, specifically the Inyambane Bay communities are seeing a decrease in rainfall and um, large scale erosion. Um, so yeah, this is something that's still being worked on. And then for that much more abstract aim of the scientist community relationship, um, you know, we, we sort of had these conversations around what do we actually give to communities in return? Um, Carla mentioned that, yes, you know, we, we use local knowledge and local knowledge was extremely useful to us. But is that actually a fair exchange to just use knowledge and, and not to actually ask firstly uh, or to make it clear what is being done with the knowledge? Um, and how do communities feel about scientists? We learned very quickly on that there are large feelings of mistrust, and this requires constant and ongoing honest communication. Now, this is also something that means different things to different stakeholder groups, or even just to different people. Um, we explore things like what role do other stakeholders play, and then how do we involve small scale harvesting communities in science, which is something that you know we could do easily in the Inyambane Bay community. Um, so we had a, a really cool event in November 2018. Um, and this was requested by the, the local communities and the NGO. So we held a bio blitz. And it was a great day. We brought um, kids over from a bunch of neighboring communities and sent them into the mangroves with cameras and tubs. And um, the, at the bottom here, you can see these are guys from the um, one of the government departments the fisheries research department. And we brought along these homemade smartphone microscopes. So we were showing them, you know, how you can actually look at um, uh, microscopic organisms using just a smartphone and a laser lens. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, and of course it was not just sort of a science community discussion, but here on the left, you've got a, a fisherman um, who is then talking about their experiences and their work to the rest of the community. And for a lot of children, this is not actually something that they hear about regularly because, you know, they're not all exposed to the same level or the same type of fishing. So it was a great cross community exchange. And of course, uh, the, I don't know, the scientists in us were just really fascinated at what we found. A lot of these things, you know, we hadn't found on our surveys, which we'd been doing for a year and a half at the stage or a year at the stage. And we wouldn't have found them, you know, had it not been for the fishes and some of the kids going out. And then, of course, just the incredible stories and input from community elders and fishers. So it really was a great opportunity just to sit and listen for once, which is something that we don't really do as scientists. And we sort of came up with this diagram. And what we looked at were the scientific focused objectives and the community focused objectives and um, whether or not this was sort of balanced. And together we decided that it was kind of balanced um, and it was really important that we did this because this was one of the big things that made the science communi community working relationship, um, which made it such a success was that we all felt we were you know, getting something for our time uh, and it was an equitable exchange. So yeah, um, a lot of lessons learned from our time in Mozambique. And um, the, the obvious lesson would be that there's a huge variation in the mangrove states, uh, how mangroves are used and the significance of mangroves between our countries. Um, there's a lot more local management in Mozambique and this is supported by um, the fisheries department, the fisheries research department rather. And they've also got um, military support. So this is the um, sort of the, the Navy, the equivalent of the Navy. And they, uh, once a month or once every two months or so, they will take uh, the 
community fishing council president around the bay to just do sort of a spot check. And it's quite intense, you know, he finds people and um, confiscates equipment um, when people are in the wrong areas or are using the wrong equipment. But it was very fascinating to be part of that. And now we're sort of gonna shed the, the ecological chatter and move a bit into the social realm because a lot of the lessons we learned were social. And the first is, the first is that um, we lack proper acknowledgement of the communities that we work around in research. And I say work around because in South Africa, we've been trained to sort of go into the field, collect our samples, make our observations and then leave, you know. It's not often that we go and we chat to people and we find out what's going on. Um, so a lot of our understanding of how mangroves are used in South Africa currently are based on research observations. And we're not social scientists. You know, most of us are not social scientists. So we are not very good at observing social uses and social behaviors. Um, another lesson is that successful conservation is not just this idea of we're collecting data and we're collecting information and we feed it into management authorities and that's what they need to do. You know, I heard the two student talks earlier and that is very much what we do as scientists and our information is definitely important. You know, we go out, we do these surveys, we find new species, we find endemic and endangered species and we feed this information into management authority. But it was a huge wake up call for me to learn that many other people are actually involved in these conservation decisions. It can't just be because this area has an endemic fish, we're not allowed to fish in it, you know? Um, and of course, this whole process takes a lot longer than you'd expect because you are building relationships of trust and communication and then finding compromises. These are all time consuming endeavors. Um, one that I debated about talking about is uh, the issue of foreign conservation NGOs in East Africa. And this was another real eye opener, you know, my time in Mozambique. I feel like in South Africa, we're, we're quite, we take charge a lot of our own research and conservation. So we don't really see this issue as much, but in Mozambique, for sure, we saw the problem of foreign conservation NGOs. And it sort of builds on this previous thing of having an idea of what an environment or space should look like and then trying to impose this space in a country that you maybe don't understand. So it's often problematic. And again, it's often led by self-interest as opposed to a real vested interest in the area. And if you look at the diagram on, on the left, you'll see that most of these organizations take different forms, but the main thing is that the, the person in charge is a foreigner. And um, when, when this is the case, it's very difficult to say that actually actions and decisions are being made because we have a real interest in this community or in this area. Um, and often these setups land up dis disempowering communities more than empowering because you are giving them the voice that you think they should have. Um, and then a very problematic thing is the disregard for permission. So many of these NGOs are operating illegally and up until recently were operating illegally uh, without permission from the government or from local communities, without even ethical clearance in some cases. And what was mind blowing to me is how easily their research is taken up and published and publicized. So I think as a scientific community, there's a question to be asked there about how careful and critical are we? Now, this was about, you know, conservation NGOs, but scientists need to be careful of not painting a similar picture. And there are many ways we can avoid doing that. Um, you know, working in foreign uh, or in a different country is really, really difficult. And um, trying to do it correctly is even more difficult because you, you really should be collaborating. You know, and you hear often the argument of actually there's no one qualified in Mozambique to do this research. But you know, a simple search or maybe a bit more of an invested search reveals that that's actually a very incorrect assumption. There are collaborators, people wanting to co-create projects and to co-author papers. There are many students, you know, I've, <laughs> I've met so many students that I couldn't actually take on as students, uh, but who really want to or, or have real ideas for what they want to research. And, you know, they're lacking a supervisor. 
or they need mentors, or they want an exchange of skills, or even just putting them in touch with um, students from your country, you know, or South African students. Um, and then lastly, you've got to respect local laws and traditions. Now, getting a permit in Mozambique is like trying to pull teeth from a chicken or a hen or whatever the saying is. Um, and that is where collaborating really, really will help you. So it's not impossible, as most people will say, it's just that you have to work a little harder. Now, we then, you know, after our year and a bit in Mozambique, returned to South Africa. And one of the things that, that we, that was sort of flashing bright in our minds is this idea that we knew very little about communities in mangrove areas along our coast. So management in South Africa is quite often top down and our, we, we do have very good laws, you know, where our integrated coastal management act talks about um, collaborative decision-making and consultation with stakeholders. But is this really our reality? And I don't know, maybe someone else can disagree with me on this, but this hasn't been what I've observed. So we left with a lot of research gaps in South Africa. And the first, you know, we can start with the basic questions. Firstly, how do communities even use this space? How do they feel about management? And from there, once you build up these conversations, you move on to things like, how do we actually work together to continue to study these areas? Um, do communities have questions that we could maybe use tools to answer? And these are not just once off questions. This is not a, a three-year uh, NRF um, to Tuka grant and then you're done and then you move on. These are actually questions that we have to keep asking and you know uh, that require continuous interaction because humans are so dynamic and the environment is so dynamic. So we wrote a paper this year um, with um, a bunch of other early career scientists and uh, around their research areas or their research locations. And we explored or we spoke a bit about <clears throat> the unjust roots of South African MPAs. So we know that marine protected areas are really necessary, but you know they've been built upon old legacies that really shouldn't stand today. And we, we explore a bit in this paper, what are the implications of actually continuing on this trajectory there's this huge push for 30 by 30, so um, protecting 30% of our oceans by 2030. Um, <clears throat> but can we just move on as we are, or does something need to shift? And if so, how do we actually gently shift this concept of MPAs in South Africa? All right, so that's kind of where it is with the mangrove research. And I'll just leave us with three parting lessons. And the first is that we tend to work in silos and it's great, actually. It's great, you know, listening to some of the talks here. It's so focused. I, I love it. I enjoy doing this sort of research myself where we just focus on one genus, on one species, on one area, because we really become biological and ecological experts. That is how we become specialists. That is how we become excellent. But for scientists these days, that's actually not enough. We need to learn to specialize, yes, but we also have to learn to listen and to collaborate across fields. So most of my colleagues are very critical of the social sciences. That has to change because social scientists, um, we can't actually study an environment without understanding how humans interact with that environment. And we are not qualified to do that. But aside from just collaborating across the sciences, you know, we need to collaborate with artists, citizens, policymakers, economists. We have to learn to speak those languages. And a really cool example is um, a colleague of ours, um, Shamir Mahmoud. Um, for those of you that don't know Shamir, he's a, um, while a, a nature filmmaker, and he recently made his first film um, called Rise from the Cape Flats. And it was all about his, um, you know, journey into free diving and into the ocean, you know, a space that he'd lived adjacent to for 30 plus years and finally um, started exploring. And so it speaks to things like access and um, who actually uses the environment and how do they use it. And we started to um, invite Shamir along on field trips. So, you know, this has been such a profound change to our field trips in a way that I couldn't actually have imagined. 
Firstly, because he comes along with his giant cameras and, and you know, takes really cool photos and videos of us doing what we're doing. But also because he has so many questions and he's really interested in learning to use scientific tools and in understanding science. So it's been a really great exchange. But then Shamir also has this habit of starting conversations in the field. And like I mentioned earlier, as scientists, we're so primed to going into a mangrove habitat, booties on, equipment on our backs, collect our samples, sort of wave and nod, greet, how are you to, you know, people maybe nearby, and that's it, we leave. Shamir starts conversations and he asks questions that we would never have asked. You know, we're all friendly people, but sometimes you just go into scientist mode. And um, so that's been a real shakeup. That's changed the way that we interact with people in the field. And we've learned a lot just from simple conversations. He also has questions for us that make us reevaluate our methods and, and, and question why actually do we do that? Um, so yeah, it's, it's good. It's almost like relearning or, or re-understanding why you do what you do or something that just becomes routine. Okay, so the second lesson is the slow but steady march of transformation. And everyone, a lot of people are very uncomfortable when we start talking about transformation. But the reality is that early career researchers, are, we're starting to ask the difficult questions. And as difficult as it might be for people to be faced with these questions, it's difficult for us too, because we're labeled as disruptors. And this is seen as a bad thing, right? But being a disruptor is not just a bad thing. It's necessary. Science is a dynamic space. It needs to be challenged. And this is just another challenge, right? So if we're going to transform our fields, it's necessary that we are disruptors, that we ask the difficult questions. And we, at some stage, just have to make peace with it. We have to make peace with the comments and the questions and the doubts. And, you know, we have to believe firmly in what we're doing. <clears throat> and the last is that the future needs to be critical, excellent, and independent. So these are skills that we then obviously try to hone in our postgraduate students. We want them to be critical. We want them to be excellent. And we want them to be so independent that they are teaching us about machine learning and complicated stats things that we've never heard of before. So why is this crucial? If we are going to transform, we can't transform at the cost of excellence. And that's often a criticism that you hear when you start talking about transformation, is that, well, we've lost excellence because people you know, just want to transform. So you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep creating and, and nurturing and mentoring excellent scientists and pushing our scientific achievements, all while continuing to reshape the way that we understand our environment. And this is not something that's just limited to postgrads. Um, it's really important to start, you know, exploring these skills with school kids. Um, on the right is actually uh, my nieces and uh, my niece and nephews. And so with our small business with Argonaut Science, we run Rocky Shore tours. And before we, we pushed these out into the world, we sort of trialed them with family. And this picture looks really staged, but actually we just looked up and this is what they were busy doing. So they'd found a, a snail and um, the youngest was trying to identify it using the two oceans. And um, the middle, um, uh, you know, my niece was sort of trying to take a photo. And uh, my nephew on the, on the right was sort of looking to see if he could see more of them. And, you know, so we want to get kids into the spaces. We need to learn how to, how to talk not just to each other, but to people across fields and age groups as well. And yeah, I think that's where we'll leave it for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nazrin. Uh, we'll take uh, questions for now, and that was such a great talk and uh, very interesting. Uh, okay, we have one question from Francesca. Always fascinating systems, uh, the mangroves, you made me homesick. Nazrin, given mm -hmm. the one of the aspects to fully consider effectiveness of conservation or management, it is to assess how far, sorry, is, Okay, can I just read that again? Given that one of the aspects to fully consider effectiveness of conservation or management, it is to assess how functionally successful certain systems 
are. Have you considered looking how connected the different patches of mangroves are from a nutrient feeding level and transport perspective? While mm. certain swamps may support nurseries, assembled is exceptional. If these patches are not connected, they are not viable in the long run, even if we manage locally. So in that Absolutely. Absolutely. Um... I think that, uh, yes, so we are, can you hear me? Okay, okay. Um, uh, I yes. think, yes, can hear you? Francesca. Francesca. Um, definitely, we're starting now to look at connectivity um, and we're, we're exploring this using <clears throat> sort of surveys, eDNA, and maybe BRUVs. Um, we'll see how it goes. But you're absolutely correct. And that plays a huge role in considering what is viable in terms of management and conservation. Um, I think that you also do a lot of this work and you might, especially from a larval perspective. So uh, you might have a lot more to say on this for sure. Thanks, Nazreen. Mm -hmm. uh, so another comment. Are you saying something, Francesca? I was just thanking Nazreen. Thank you so much. Another it was a great, yeah. Okay. okay. A comment from Francesca. Will you agree, Nazreen, with your name, recipient of research from the Global North, relatives of top down effects um, you referred to? Thanks, Francesca. Um, okay, another comment oh, from Nogbonga. Thank you so much for your talk. Indeed, the idea, the idea of engaging more community stakeholders is a great approach for people like me who originally come mm -hmm. from the village which is along the coast. I often get comments like your people, scientists, just restricted us to fish from mm -hmm. our ocean. Whereas they are those, uh, whereas they are the ones who are doing overfishing with big nets and stuff. <laughs> so engaging more community members, bringing them on the table to make them feel involved. Thanks, Nawonga. Um, from Anthony, that's a very sorry, that's a very interesting perspective about foreign NGOs. Probably the same for researchers from foreign universities and I agree that um, it's a problem that projects aren't led by local nationals but do you think that NGOs don't serve, don't serve any values in supporting management activities or promoting knowledge exchange and capacity development in countries where management is needed but legal money but legal research is taking place so oh, that's a question for um, you Nazri. I, I, I don't think that at all. Um, I think that they do have an extremely important role. I guess my point is more that we have to interrogate these roles and these, uh, you know, our motives. And um, a large part of shaping these is more conversations with, you know, even where local capacity maybe doesn't exist or resources don't exist, how then do we bring in the local perspective so that, you know, it's, you know, that's, that, excuse me, it's balanced and equitable rather than just coming in with the idea of let's save the whale shark and not really realizing that this reef that you're now excluding um, fishermen from is an important reef for them for a bunch of reasons that you haven't bothered to find out. So no, no, that's, yeah, uh, I hope that answers that question. Definitely an important role for NGOs, just that we need to rethink the way that we support these NGOs and the way that they interact in that space. Thanks, Nazreen. Um, another question from Carla. Thanks, Nazreen, for the fantastic talk filled with important lessons. What advice do you have for our students and early career researchers for conceptualizing research that is aware of social needs, societal needs, sorry? What is a good starting point for stepping out of your silo? You know, you can, you can do two things here. You can actually um, 
if you, if you are serious about it and if you really want to, if you have a project and you're ready to take it to the next step, start reaching out to social scientists and to maybe people or users in the field. Um, maybe you you work in an area and there are fishers, you know, fishermen or fish, well, fishers, sorry. Um, start more conversations, ask people, ask them about your study organisms, you know, start conversations like that. Um, but you can also have fun with it. So, for example, taking Shamir on field trips has really been um, a stepping out of a, a silo in a way that we couldn't have uh, anticipated. And that was just, you know, taking along someone with a camera who really wanted to see these areas and to learn more about the science in these areas. So you can have fun with it. It doesn't have to be like a dedicated field assistant. Take friends, you know, in other fields, um, take your economist friends and um, start conversations around that, uh, around your system with them, you know, see if you can relate to each other that way. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, Nazreen. Um, and Pakam is struggling with her connectivity, so I just thought I'd take over at this point. Um, thank you so much for your talk and the questions. I think there were some really important lessons um, that you've raised about the importance of community-led research and how we should really make an effort to develop relationships with the community and use that to inform our research. So thank you so much for joining today. And um, there's quite a bit of chat going on in the chat box, which you're welcome to continue. Mm -hmm. um, but we are scheduled to break now for lunch. Um, so thanks for joining us. Please stick around if you can, and hopefully we hear from you soon. So we'll be having lunch thanks now. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. And we will return at um, half past one. So it's a 45 minute lunch slot.